Today's topic, uh, uh, title of the today's presentation, as Melissa mentioned, Kicking Grass in Hawaii for Wildfire Management and Restoration. Um, oh, wait, backing up here. Uh, uh, I'm again, my name is James Leary. I'm faculty with the Department of Natural Resource and Environmental Management. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm getting feedback. Uh, did someone have their speaker on? Testing. Okay, that's better. Thank you. Uh, but there's a lot of people that I've worked with over the last decade that uh, have contributed to this research. And I'll be sure to highlight those individuals who have participated and helped me better understand what we know about grass control. The objective today is to discuss management of grass fuel loads below risk thresholds. That's an overarching theme. Again, we won't give specific recipes, but certainly hopefully encourage new ideas on how to tackle this really large problem. Uh, subjects of interest here, my familiarity is with research in managing or controlling Kikuyu grass and fountain grass, both penicetums, which I think are now Senchris uh, species. I always get confused when they've changed the botanical names. Um, learning outcomes uh, that I hope to share from the re my research and experience include residual herbicide activities on dormant fountain grass, suppressing Kikuyu grass with pre and post plant herbicide, and accelerating the restoration trajectory of Acacia koa. Again, I know this is about uh, fire suppression, but I thought the restoration component is an obvious fit and, and really what I focused on previously. And at the end, I'd like to share with you another concept too with developing heuristic models for monitoring Kikuyu grass growth using temperature and moisture data. C4 grassy biome. So these two penicetums, Kikuyu grass and fountain grass are both C4 species. C4 grassy biomes are dominant in tropical and subtropical climatic zones that also support forests. The C4 photosynthetic, photosynthetic pathway differs from the C3 by the addition of a CO2 concentrating mechanism at the site of carboxylation. Uh, we're not gonna be quizzed on this, but anyways, just getting technical on the physiology of these C4 species. And the, the importance of that C4 pathway is that it reduces photorespiration. Uh, so it's, uh, it's more efficient with CO2 and more efficient at retaining moisture. Um, and so it makes, gives it a competitive advantage in hot and dry environments. It's able to photosynthesize with lower available moisture typically. C4 grassy biomes are hard to predict with global vegetation models based on bottom-up climatic and edaphic conditions. In other words, uh, soil moisture or nutrient status typically is not a good uh, indicator for where C4 grassy biomes should persist. Again, the overlap of C4 grassy biomes with forested biomes is a, is a perplexing situation. So let's talk about the grass fire cycle. Theoretically, ecosystem physiology should predict woody forest replacement of early successional grasslands. But much of the global mismatch between actual and potential vegetation could be explained with top-down fire. So when we talk about bottom-up being uh, with regulation of moisture and temperature and other abiotic conditions, it's those top-down functions, in this case fire, which may in fact be encouraging the grass, uh, the grass biomes over the woody biomes. I think this is perceptive to the audience uh, on, on this uh, webinar, but uh, interesting nonetheless and certainly worth studying further to really understand this uh, global mechanism. Grass fire cycle is a species driven positive feedback loop perpetuating top down fire events followed by competitive response advantages exceeding woody species capabilities. And again, thinking about that C4 physiology mechanism as a potential advantage. Okay, so let's talk about our first, uh, first experiment here. Oh wait, what's going on here? Okay, first experiment uh, to determine the residual activities of amazapir and glyphosate. I don't like this thing. Uh, no, I don't want to. 
I'm trying to move this out of the way so I can see my own slide. Uh, okay, anyways, I'll, I'll fake it. Uh, determine the residual activities of imazepirum glyphosate on dormant fountain grass. The approach to these experiments uh, were, in, were uh, the approach was to install and monitor a replicated field experiment on dormant fountain grass at the Bohakaloa training area in 2007. You'll see uh, the right, the left panel, me uh, treating uh, basically dormant fountain grass. The treatments were made in April of 2007. And you can see precipitation in inches over this time period prior to treatment, uh, a significant drought period that extended well beyond that treatment. So finally, at the end of the year, 2007 of December, uh, we start to see an increase a substantial increase in, in precipitation and moisture availability. So this gives some, some context to the actual treatment uh, uh, in this situation. Uh, we did not plan for this. This was not ideal. Most herbicide applications on the label, it encourages treatment of green, actively growing tissues. This is hardly green and actively growing, but it's what we had. We're, you know, arriving at the site and we made a, a game time decision of let's make these treatments uh, under the, these conditions and with an expectation that we're going to be underwhelmed by the results anyways. So this is a randomized complete block design replicated four times. Uh, the treatments were a mazapir at a half a kilo, about a half a kilogram per hectare of acid equivalents, the amount of active ingredient applied per unit area, and glyphosate at approximately at twice that amount uh, at 1.25 kilograms per hectare. Uh, separate treatments of comparing imazapir to glyphosate at different uh, at these different rates, uh, but rates within the label uh, recommendations. These were also in a factorial combination with other adjuvants, methylated seed oils, and non-ionic surfactants to improve the spreadability of the herbicides. Uh, based on the results, there was no significant effect and it would not be useful to this audience to try to tease that out. Instead, we're just going to focus on the active ingredients of imazapir versus glyphosate. And then as part of the data management regime, this was a non-destructive harvesting approach using digital imagery, old I call it old school remote sensing with close range nadir position or, uh, above the canopy within the treatment plot, recording uh, one meter square uh, samples throughout the entire plot. So we captured the entire plot with, it, with imagery and then stitched those together, stitched um, uh, for uh, visual detection of greenness. Moving on. Doesn't like me. Okay, here we go. So in January of 2008, you remember the rains uh, returned in December of 2007. Uh, in January 2008, we had an opportunity to visit the site for the first time at, a, at 41 weeks after treatment, which is about uh, 10 months later. Uh, and what you'll notice and what we immediately noticed was really interesting. Again, we're treating grass that's basically the living dead. There was no green tissues on the grass is treated. Uh, it was an advanced climatic stand, uh, untouched for some time. And what we're seeing is the white flags on the left and the right indicating the imazapir treatment. And in the middle is the glyphosate treatment, really distinguishing the difference in, a, in herbicidal effect, treating a dormant grass where imazapir was able to uh, affect a symptom uh, of the herbicide on dormant grasses. And this is really a testament to our knowledge of imazapir's uh, residual activity in dry environments. A um, little bit of background, imazapir, the active ingredient, uh, affects its mode of action, affects branch chain amino acid production. Won't get into that part of it, but what we also know is that um, it has an aquatic use registration because in aquatic systems, when it's interacting with water, the breakdown is hydrolytic, uh, and with a half-life measured in hours within a 24-hour period. Uh, in this case, in a dry environment, we can get residual activity for several hundred days. Uh, and with grasses trying to respond to the precipitation, 
is taking up that herbicide and showing these early sign, early uh, symptoms developing. Whereas Roundup has no residual activity, is bound to the organic matter in the soil and will not be taken up by roots or anything like that. And so this is why we see no effect of Roundup or glyphosate treating dormant vegetation. And it shows with our, uh, with our remote sensing capabilities, uh, we show uh, the Amazapur effect on the left and the lack of effect on the right with the green up events occurring in the glyphosate treatment. And again, when we score it of a one and zero based on presence, absence of green up event, we can clearly see and quantify the effects of imazapir versus glyphosate at 41 weeks after. At 49 weeks after, two months later, now we start to see some more green up events within imazapir starting to recover from that herbicide application approximately one year later, uh, within several weeks of being one year. So uh, not lethal, it was a sublethal application, uh, treating uh, climax, heavy, heavily vegetated, dormant grass. This is, uh, we now see a 49 weeks of break in the residual activity. And it shows again in our, uh, in our quantification. Uh, just to uh, wrap this up, what was interesting was morphologically the pattern of regeneration, it was not seedlings, it was not seed germination that we were observing. There were actually uh, regeneration within the clump. It was in what we were observing what are called ramets sprouting from the edge of the perennial clump. And these in, uh, ramets are actually individual plantlets that if they were separated out would, would uh, persist and survive. So really interesting morphology of the fountain grass I know very little about, but clearly had an effect on herbicide performance. Where you see in the heart of the clump, uh, the herbicide was, was lethal, but this is a, a clearly a mechanism of resistance and tolerance to herbicide applications and survival. Okay, moving on, our next experiment I'd like to share with you. Sorry, I'm moving real fast because I got a lot of stuff to share with you guys. Uh, and hopefully I can choke it all out. Um, our next experiment is to determine pre-plant suppression with imazapir and glyphosate on kikuyu grass. We're now switching species and switching herbicides. No, same herbicides, different species. Uh, and how that will accelerate the growth trajectory of outplanted koa. So this is an experiment established at Ulapalakula Ranch on Maui, uh, initiated in 2011 and monitored until 2013. So the treatment was pre-plant, so one month prior to uh, planting the uh, koa seedlings, uh, we treated the plot with a combination of amazapir and glyphosate, both at 1.7 kilograms acid equivalent per hectare, which is equal to uh, one and a half pounds per acre. Uh, this, uh, for those keeping score at home, this is the maximum label rate you can apply with imazapir and about quarter rate for um, glyphosate, but definitely the max label rate for imazapir. At zero months after treatment, we planted seedlings that were approximately 105 days old. Uh, in one by one meter spacings, that's an artificial spacing. Typical uh, operational spacings are gonna be on the order of three meters um, and uh, with a total of 20 experimental trees. We also installed a data logger with soil sensors, monitoring uh, temperature and volumetric water content. We had them installed at 10 centimeter depth, which is about four inches, and also at 25 centimeter depth, with this, which is a 10, uh, 10 inches. So uh, these were mo monitored hourly. So we uh, generated a pretty robust data set of the soil environment in each of these treatment plots uh, with or without herbicide applications as pre-treatment. So a little bit of background. Uh, Kikuyu grass is quite prevalent in music montane environments, most of us know. Uh, it's also where koa 
uh, is uh, it's also considered suitable co habitat. So we have this interaction. Um, historically, animals were brought in and grazed cuckoo grass is still a very effective and important forage species. But in areas where uh, rain, uh, pasture management is phasing out and there's an emphasis on restoration, typically we start with uh, ungulate exclusion and fencing. And then what ends up resulting is unchecked growth of kukuyu grass. In this case, you can see at waist high, this is equivalent to anywhere from 15 to 50 megagrams per hectare. So a substantial amount of biomass, above ground biomass generated by this species. Also, I, I'm not, not as familiar with it, but I, I do understand that historically, Kukuyu grass fires are quite infamous because of the stolons that fire can carry underground and pop up in, in a novel locations. So it's a very hazardous situation, allowing for kukuyu grass to grow unchecked like this. Glyphosate and amazapir are, are known to be highly effective short and long-term suppressors of kukuyu grass, respectively. Similarly to what we showed you with fountain grass. So here we, ha uh, we have an example on the left with uh, with glyphosate treated 30 days, uh, three months prior, and then a grass clipping. And you can see uh, in the center of the grass clipping, recovery and green up of kukuyu grass from stolons, uh, showing the lack of systemic uh, uh, potential of the glyphosate or residual activity, if you will. Whereas on the uh, right-hand side, in a Mazapir application separate from this glyphosate, you can see the residual effects of a mazapir three months after application, about 100 days. This is typical of what we'll see with a mazapir, um, where not only are you killing off the upper foliar canopy, but you're also getting it to go systemic into the stolons and really reducing recovery efforts. So in, in, as, a, as a comparison, a mazapir is quite more effective than glyphosate. But Together, you get a really nice complement where uh, Roundup will show symptoms in as early as uh, 20 to 30 days. It typically takes about 100 days for a mazapir to show this kind of result. So this is a new result. Uh, you would not even know you treated uh, if you checked at 30 to 50 days after application. That's the that's one of the defects of a mazapir. But combined, you get the best of both worlds. I really like them together. Uh, moving on. Also, what we have some anecdotal evidence on is that koa as a legume shows a really strong tolerance to imazapir. This is an actual application from helicopter, a boom application, controlling kukuyu grass with imazapir with koa seedlings surviving a direct application. This is phenomenal. Uh, we do know that imazapir tends to be weak on legumes and really has a strong potential for developing a program for selective control, grass control in coa restoration. Um, you know, spoiler alert, there's a lot of work left to be done. I think it's something very worthy to continue with. I, I'm not going to be able to share with you really substantial uh, empirical evidence other than what we've seen anecdotally, but I've seen it and I've repeated it and it's uh, extremely valuable and something we really need to uh, give some attention to. Well, so maybe I am going to share some data on this, but as a pre-plant. So remember, this experimental design at Ulubalakua was a pre-plant 30 days prior to planting. So at four months after treatment, which is three months after planting, what we, what we noticed is, oh, this is a little bit cut off. Oops, sorry, going back. A little bit cut off on the bottom here, but what we saw was gray is, um, gray is uh, untreated and red is treated. Um, what we're showing is leader height in the untreated was actually significantly taller than the treated. And in the treated, what we're seeing is some symptoms of epinasty and apical bud break, uh, sorry, uh, distal bud break uh, proliferation. Those are classic symptoms of, inj of mazapir injury. So we talked about tolerance and clearly at a maximum rate within 30 days, uh, we are stressing these seedlings and it, their tolerance capabilities uh, relative to untreated control where it's just grass grow proliferating and koa looking as green as can be and it looks happy and it's like why would we even bother 
suppressing grass if that's what it looks like. We have taller plants already. So clearly we went backwards on this treatment. What's interesting about this also is that root collar dimensions were significantly larger at the soil, at the soil surface, soil interface for treated versus untreated. That could also be a symptom of the herbicide or it could be something else. Root collar uh, diameters are good proxies for root development. And I won't take it any further than that, but let's uh, continue on. Okay, now we're at 12 months after treatment and we show a reversal of fortune with significantly greater COA growth in grass suppression treatment. So we we're slow out of the blocks, but at 12 months after, you can clearly see the difference in COA growth as a result of suppression of Kukuyu grass in the treatment plot versus where the treatment plots are or in the untreated plots, it almost looks as if CO is in this uh, state of suspended animation. And I should say that and throughout the entire experiment that we had over 95% survival. So we don't see grass killing trees and you would see that in restoration. If you just plunk trees into grass, the, the trees will survive. But we're not recognizing the loss in productivity on the site as a result of this suppression action. So clearly removing competition that will enhance the uh, COA production is what we're seeing at 12 months after versus that what appeared to be an early debacle at four months after treatment. So at 36 months after treatment, um, what we're showing is uh, treated plots or grass suppression demonstrating significantly higher, uh, taller trees, sorry, it's significantly taller trees and significantly larger root collar systems. At about 36 months, I think we're seeing because of the spacings, uh, we're now probably having confoundment as a result of interest species competition. But nonetheless, within three years of monitoring, we show significant differences demonstrating the value of grass suppression in a restoration effort. Also, I think what's really interesting is we, if we consider the, uh, the sensors that were installed in the soil, if we just focused on the 10 centimeter depth, what we're showing is over time from planting to the, the three year mark, you'll show, uh, so the black line is herbicide treatment, the gray line is no herbicide. And what we show is, um, is Temp, um, moisture content, volumetric water content of the soil is comparable at early treatment. And then as the treatment starts to take effect and the grass is starting to die back, you see moisture levels at uh, higher than what is observed in the untreated plots, suggesting uh, moisture uh, acquisition by the grass. Uh, sorry, and but then, and at the same time, on this top plot, you show height growth of COA. And it doesn't separate out until year two or the, after the first year when we start to reach log phase growth response. It's linear starting out, roots are establishing, it's getting comfortable with its own, and then it naturalizes and realizes it's going to make it. And then so at year, at year two is when you start to see uh, log growth rates, which is what we're seeing here. And this is also when, interestingly enough, when we see a huge plummet in the volumetric water content in the COA treatment plots, in the herbicide treatment plots. Again, uh, or what this is showing is the demand for moisture by COA when it starts to achieve log growth rates or exponential growth rates in the plots. So this is a really interesting phenomenon. I wish I could explain it better, but I think something really to pay attention to. Moisture drives plant productivity in any situation. It's temperature and moisture. And this is clearly a huge uh, uh, mediated event based on the conditions we imposed in these treatment plots. All right, moving to the next experiment. We are now determining fusillade DX, fluazifop uh, p-butyl is the active ingredient. It's a grass selective herbicide. And we are determining the fusillade regimen in suppressing kikuyu grass. And again, in the, with the growth response of COA. So now we're talking about a grass selective herbicide as a post plant treatment after the COA have been installed. So uh, as opposed to the previous experiment where it was all pre-plant. This is a two by two factorial. This was actually with and without 
herbicide and fertilizer applications. So with the fuselade, without the fuselade, with the fertilizer, without the fertilizer. This was again, another restoration design. Blazapop uh, was applied at the highest recommended rate of uh, 0.4 kilograms active ingredient. And the fertilizer was a basic triple 16 at 100 kilograms of nitrogen for rat care. Yes, koa is a legume, but I can promise you uh, 100 times out of 100, if you give it nitrogen fertilizer, it will take it up and you will see a response, guaranteed. Okay, applications were made. This is an interesting process. So this was a post-plant regimen where we were making treatment applications, fertilizer and herbicide applications every four months for up to 16 months. So that's a pretty intensive regimen for really uh, suppressing grass and pushing the growth and establishment of koa. We monitored the biomass of kukui grass and koa every four months with those treatment uh, schedules. Kukuyu grass is a stoloniferous species, and in fact, it has three fractions. It has the foliar fraction, which is what we see at the top, which and the stolen fraction on the bottom, and then you have a significant amount of thatch uh, detrital material mixed in with it. And uh, what's interesting to note is when you look at kukuyu grass, first of all, it's uh, it does not produce a lot of seed. Uh, in Hawaii, it could be a climatic situation. It produces seed in other places, but typically in Hawaii, it's vegetative, and the stolons are its, uh, its re uh, pro it are its uh, reproductive material. I'm saying it wrong, but anyways, you know what I mean. Um, and uh, what's interesting about this is the foliar fraction that you see at the top represents less than 10% of the total biomass of that sward profile to the soil surface. So. 80, uh, up to 80% of, of the total above ground biomass is stolen material. So that's a, a lot of restorative capacity or regenerative capacity retained within this grass ward, especially when it's unchecked. And just to give some, uh, some indication, you can see these stolen pieces as little as an inch in, in length, able to uh, regenerate and, and uh, establish new shoots and roots. A really phenomenal energy source stored in this stolen bank. So if you can think of um, a management tactic for, for kukuyu grass, clearly you're targeting the restorative capacity of the stolen bank, as opposed to other plant species where you'd be targeting exhaustion of the seed bank. Here we want to exhaust the stolen bank. So the results at four months after the second application, four months after the third application, and four months after the fourth application, well after a year of this regimen, we show an oscillating suppression and recovery of the foliar fraction leading to stolen bank decline. So the, the, um, you can see uh, good foliar dieback after the, uh, after the first application, the second treatment, treating a very minuscule amount of green tissue. And then four months later, full recovery. I think this is also in the springtime. So having an effect on that. And then treating that on the third application, whoops, going back, resulting in this. So you have this uh, for the herbicide. So for untreated uh, herbicide uh, plots, you can see a fairly flat, stable uh, condition of, in terms of the representation of the foliar fraction, the gray lines here, uh, with or without fertilizer. Disregard the fertilizer for this time being. Uh, it, it, but with the herbicides, we show a really strong oscillation where we're really pushing and pulling on its restorative capacity, trying to, uh, to fight uh, uh, any kind of recovery. So staying on top of it with repeated cycle, clearly what we're identifying is fuselade is, as a single application is ineffective. It would uh, already with four applications, we're demonstrating its ca capabilities of uh, restoring uh, as if you'd never treated. And so with this regimen of multiple post-plant applications, we can see the difference between gray and green, where the gray is pretty flat, again, indicating a climax stand, um, where for the uh, herbicide regimen, we show a, a steady linear decline of the stolen bank leading towards eventual exhaustion. A lot of, a lot of uh, resources and a fairly disciplined 
uh, management regimen, but nonetheless, as a selective herbicide, uh, this is how we've demonstrated fusillate's performance, less effective than glyphosate and amazapir as a single application, but in, in the herbicide world, selectivity is gold. So definitely a really valuable tool in spite of the fact that you really got to stay on top of it if you're dealing with cougar grass. How'd this affect growth performance of COA? So again, we have this factorial design uh, without and with fertilizer on the, on the column and without and with herbicide on the row. And so without any of them, you see COA growth uh, again, survival is 100%, but here's your kind of your growth response. Everything's really packed together tightly. Lot, not a lot of, uh, this is canopy height, by the way. Um, so everything's, uh, you get about a meter in 12 months after planting on the average. Here we show with the herbicide reducing, suppressing cuckoo grass and reducing the competition, we are showing how we're starting to see a stretch in performance, uh, higher mean value of these plots. Also, we should know that um, uh, COA is uh, uh, open pollinated, and so there's a lot of genetic variability. So you're showing a really strong expression of genetic variability as we reduce the uh, the competition of cuckoo grass relative to when, when you're uh, competing with COA, there's not a lot of genetic variability in expression. Uh, for fertilizer applications, we see less of an effect uh, between with and without herbicide showing an ameliorative effect of the fertilizer uh, accommodating um, growth performance of COA, suggesting that maybe the competition is nutrient related. Uh, so worth noting. Okay, our last experiment. Uh, this is a heuristic Kikuyu grass growth models in mesic montane environments for predicting growth responses to climatic conditions. Our approach was to install and monitor the Kula Belt Pasture Production Observatory Network, which is basically a cage, an exclusion cage for monitoring grass growth with data loggers that included uh, photosynthetic active radiation, relative humidity, ambient temperature, and my favorite, soil temperature and volumetric water content, which we'll be focusing on here. You can see for Maui, we've had uh, several of these observatories established along what I call the Kula Belt, where we pair where we paired these observatories with low and high elevation, where the low uh, observatories had a mean elevation of 2,000 feet uh, above sea level, and the high had an average of 3,800 feet above sea level. Um, and uh, also knowing that north is here, uh, there's orographic rain patterns similar to all the other islands. So we have this almost this perfect natural gradient of temperature as it relates to lapse rate and elevation. And then also this uh, precipitation band from high to low, from, no, from the windward side to leeward side, maintaining elevational contour. So um, as part of this data regimen, we were collecting forage samples monthly to 10 centimeter stubble heights in coordination with recommendations by the Natural, uh, uh, Na uh, Natural National Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, of the USDA. And so we're recording data loggers on hourly and monthly ca uh, collections of forage, above ground forage, largely foliar fraction of kikuyu grass. So volumetric water content flux from July to, oh, sorry, this was installed in July 2012, monitored till 2014. So volumetric water content, which is percent amount of water to the percent uh, volume of soil. Um, we installed these uh, observatories right in the middle of a severe drought. And what we show is, uh, so uh, I'm highlighting three different pairwise observatories. We have what we call the Olinda Makawao pair. We have the Kula pair, upper and lower Kula. And then we have the Ulupalakua pair, upper and lower. And so what we automatically show is uh, the blue is the upper, uh, upper observatories and green is the lower. You can see from 2012 to 2000, uh, January 2014, so the entire July 
2013, you show a lot of uh, low, uh, long stretches of no moisture availability. This is, I'm sorry, this is volumetric water content that coincide with precipitation events. So from 2012 to 2014, long stretches of, of no precipitation. Here's another example uh, here and then in here. So maintaining average low volumetric water content, which as a really cheap proxy to available water for plants, though technically that's not the case, but it is a good proxy. If you don't have high volumetric water content, you're not gonna have water available for plant uptake and growth. And then in 2014, we see, so show a break in the drought with more frequent and increased precipitation events uh, in all of the locations. And so this is a nice uh, historical timepiece from drought to replenishment in this environment from 2012 to 2014. This is a temperature profile of Maui. Again, the pairwise uh, plots showing segregation. First of all, you show seasonality of temperature profiles and a segregation where the lower elevations are having uh, significantly higher temperature uh, regimes than the upper, uh, very consistently. I'm glad the climate's working for us. And these loggers are confidently displaying high value data. Um, much more substantial separation at Makawao versus the Ulupalakua and Kula sites, but again, clear separation in temperature profiles, which certainly coincides with what we understand about lapsed rate and the elevational increase. And here we show our average elevational uh, environmental lapse rate at six and a half uh, uh, degrees Celsius per, um, uh, per thousand uh, meters. Uh, so again, coinciding with what we understand scientifically. So again, a reliable way to measure temperature on this environment based on elevation. Below you'll show, we show um, temperature ranges, seasonal temperature ranges, again, showing the seasonal sinusoids. Similarly for moisture, higher moisture events in the winter months. Uh, I, I didn't do a very good job of explaining this, but I'm describing it for you now. Um, cooler temperatures in the winter, warmer temperatures in the summer, obviously. Higher moisture events during the winter and lower moisture in the summer, coinciding with a Mediterranean climate that we experience on Maui and the rest of Hawaiian Islands. Uh, what was interesting to note is the change in the temperature between in seasons between the upper and higher were much more substantial for temperature during the winter months. It was much greater uh, temperature difference during the winter, whereas, uh, and uh, similarly, uh, no, I'm sorry, but in during the summer is when we'd experience the greatest separation in precipitation as it relates to elevation. Uh, I can't explore it any further than that, but uh, something definitely to consider uh, greater temperature differences during the winter, greater precipitation differences during the summer, and how that may influence growth and productivity of kikuyu grass. So, okay, so this is, uh, let's see if I can explain this. Uh, this is exploratory research, a very artistic way of developing heuristic growth models based on growing degree day models, which have been used extensively in orchard systems for monitoring phenological events, flowering, fruit production uh, as a way to schedule uh, agronomic and, and, and horticultural harvests and, and pest management and things like that. Very valuable tool. And again, heuristic meaning that um, it's simple numbers to collect and it translates into intuitive results that can be interpreted and utilized in the field. So what we want to know is can we use, can we monitor temperature and moisture in an environment and predict the growth and productivity of kikuyu grass in the Kula Belt? So here on the left, we have production raw values across a, a timeline, and it shows this uh, nonlinear function as it relates to early phase drought having a significant effect on growth performance of kikuyu grass until finally it starts to reach exponential rates of productivity 
with greater levels of precipitation. So if we take that production and we divide it by, uh, and we consider the temperature and moisture regimes of that period, uh, of those periods, uh, monitoring periods, uh, in this case, we use what are called second order polynomials, where it just shows a sharp peak that will give us the op maximum temperature and moisture used as to input models to develop uh, logistic functions that have op a maximum and minimum and then an inflection point at the center for each one of these. And we took those inflection points and we used those as, to, as a way to predict temperature and moisture events or conditions based on growth performance here with the assumption that you're going to get higher productivity during the summer with warmer temperatures, including at lower elevations, and you're going to get best performance in high moisture conditions. And so with just using temperature and moisture regimes, developing growing, grow, growing, degree, growing degree days or growing degree hours, in our case, we were able to convert this production, this raw production uh, over time, and actually linearize it with degree hours in the millions um, with really strong linear fit. So theoretically, this needs to be vetted a little more, uh, obviously, but theoretically, if we understand the temperature and the water content of the soil in an area that's dominated by kikuyu grass, we should be able to predict the amount of productivity occurring in that area. And which, of course, growth and productivity of kikuyu grass equates to fuel loading. So work in progress, but definitely this is the kind of response that gives you reliability and confidence in using this heuristic model. Okay, so to wrap this up in conclusion, in determining the residual activities of amazapir and glyphosate on dormant fountain grass, what we've concluded so far, Smazapir exhibits residual activity in low moisture conditions, offering some flexibility in fuel load reduction, but it's still inferior to timing these interventions with green up events, particularly post fire. You can see here's an event that was a week after the fire occurred. And I'd say really, if you were a manager of this area, your window is about a month to two months, depending on the precipitation in the season. If it's a winter with an expectation of high moisture content, you would be scheduling your, your spray and treatment of this area at about one month or two months after. So your window of opportunity is very limited and should be targeting the green up events. Mazapir giving some flexibility to that decision making. Uh, determining pre and post plant suppression with the Mazapir and glyphosate and fluezapop uh, on kikuyu grass. These three herbicide options are effective in reducing the regenerative stolen bank and consequently enhances growth performance of outplanted boa overstory, which is ultimately the long-term suppression of breaking that fire cycle and uh, displacing grass with woody vegetation types. Uh, that's a bigger picture but this is, these are the mechanisms or techniques that we may deploy in achieving that breaking of the grass fire cycle. And then of course, here is the uh, Kikuyu grass growth models and music montane environments for predicting growth responses to climatic conditions. What we can conclude so far is growing degree day models could facilitate better monitoring of fuel loading events dictated by elevational and or graphic microclimates, understanding precipitation events and the elevation as it relates to temperature and temperature influencing growth uh, response of the, of the grass species. So uh, I would like to thank several of my partners and collaborators who worked with me on several of these projects from U.S. Forest Service, Oregon State University, University of Washington, and my home, University of Hawaii, Manoa. I really appreciate the opportunities working with a lot of you folks, uh, developing some of these interesting conclusions and ideas. Uh, this is not exhaustive. This is, I mean, what, what I can ultimately conclude with is there's a career's worth of work to do. Uh, this scratches the surface in terms of real management of grasses as it relates to fire management. 
there's a lot of work still to be done experimentally to really fine tune the conditions, but the technologies that are becoming available have really enhanced our understanding. This is back, a lot of this work was a decade ago. And today, if I was to tackle this kind of work, it would, I'd be probably approaching it with much different uh, lens than what I had uh, starting out uh, originally. Also, I want to acknowledge the support for this, these projects, largely uh, USDA with our T-STAR grant program that is now defunct, the NRCS uh, with their conservation innovation grant, and our, um, oh, I misspelled it, uh, our USDA Rural Resources Extension Act. Um, internal funding for maintaining our extension. And what I want to extend to you guys is there are opportunities to really ramp up fuel load reduction and grass suppression in these environments. Hawaii has a grass problem and we have immediate solutions that can be implemented. There's still a lot of work to be done, but it starts today with you guys really deciding what you want the landscape to look like and how you're going to protect our environment. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you so much, James. Um, we have a couple questions. I forgot to mention at the beginning of the webinar that if you have a question or comment um, for James or the group in general, you can uh, type in a question in the control panel or raise your hand um, and we'll repeat back any questions you type in or call on you if you've raised your hand. So I'm gonna start with a question from Andrea Gill um, and I'll read out her question. Okay, thank uh, for, you. For context, she says, uh, in case it matters, the location I'm dealing with is Palihua, a dry area in the Southern end of the Waianais. Her okay. question is, I'm mostly interested in Guinea grass and buffalo grass, also pasture species. Are they C4? How much of the information on Kikuyu and fountain grass applies to Guinea grass? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, kind of, sort of. Uh, they're all, those are also C4 African species. They originate from the continent of Africa. Guinea grass is a different genus. Um, Buffalo grass is Sencra ciliera, so it's highly related to, or it's related to Kikuyu grass and also fountain grass. And it's also a lower stature. Um, uh, uh, Buffalo grass, similarly to fountain grass, is Highly, uh, I'm going to let me back up. Uh, buffalo grass is highly sensitive to all of these herbicide options, more so than fountain grass. I find fountain grass a real challenge in controlling, uh, being controlled by herbicides, and I don't think I'm alone in that thinking. Uh, but buffalo grass is very prone and highly sensitive to herbicides, so there's a likelihood of greater success with a herbicide program to manage buffalo grass. Guinea grass is another one that is way under tested. And I think size matters in this case. Um, there's some work from our former graduate student, Lisa Ellsworth, um, that looked at suppression as it relates to using native species canopy, mid-story canopy and woody species to compete. And the cha and it, quite challenging. Um, herbicide wise, it has shown sensitivity to some of the herbicides that we've used. But it's just, it has a lot more energy built into its uh, into the clump. It's very responsive to the uh, dry conditions or to rain events. Uh, and um, obviously, it, it, as a fuel load, it's much more hazardous than the other species in some ways. Um, but I think uh, for all of these grasses, including guinea grass, the best opportunity to use herbicide effectively, excuse me, effectively, is on green up events with uh, if you have mechanical or mastication techniques using browsing animals to bring down that thatch level from something that's 15 feet tall to something that's less than two feet tall. I think again size matters and so being able to make herbicide applications to small young actively growing tissues will give you much better results and it's really important. So if uh, so mechanical uh, operations uh, prior to herbicide can be highly effective though expensive. And in some cases not an option because of the terrain. Uh, Hawaii's uh, topography is usually one of the bigger impediments to effective management of these grasses and other invasive species. Okay, 
Um, just we have a number of questions, so I'm going to move through them. Okay. Um, Jenna Masters asks, has there been any studies on application on burnt grass post fire? Um, I think that that relates to what you're saying. Have, on, have which, been... on which on which grass? Sorry. Um, oh, burnt just... grass. Burnt yeah. grass post fire. No, and that's my that's one of my biggest regrets. And I know Clay's on the line. Clay, we have got to take advantage of fire events and by installing herbicide treatments to really demonstrate uh, the functionality of timing and responsiveness to post-fire conditions. It's really, I mean, it, you know, it's a deleterious situation, but it's really also an opportunity. My sense of it is, is that will pay the biggest dividends. We're not going to get rid of fires today. They're going to continue happening. Can we get ourselves, uh, can, we, can we be responsive enough to those situations and take advantage of that? Um, it's really important. And it, it does relate to the, the, the bio volume and the detrital materials that are unresponsive to herbicide treatment. So um, we know that these grasses are highly stimulated by fire and, and especially when with precipitation that follows. Okay, um, another question from Eileen Ye. What about Wainaku Hi, grass? Which As one, Wainaku? Wainaku and um, I'm Panicum, or I, I don't. Yeah, well, Panicum is uh, will, is uh, going to be Guinea grass or other species. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget Wainaku, but I'm semi familiar with it. I think in this case, uh, when it comes to these three herbicides mentioned, um, Imazapir and Glyphosate, these are broad spectrum herbicides. They're going to knock out broad leaves and grasses, uh, and it's species dependent. Um, but they are our best grass control herbicides across the board. If those two don't work, we're in big trouble if we find a species that imazapir or glyphosate is not working. Uh, and fusillate as a grass selective herbicide is not as effective, but gives you that, that uh, selective opportunity when it's growing with other desirable vegetations. So that's its, um, you know, that's its value. Uh, so Wainaku grass, and I'm misremembering its genus species, obviously, but uh, definitely the regiments or the prescriptions that are, you know, interpreted here, I think would apply there too. Or, or if, as an unknown, those are the first things I would be testing for sure. Uh, okay, we have another question from Carolyn Wong. Yes, hi, one? Carolyn. Oh, it's like a blast from the past today. Yeah. Is your work on the heuristic Kikuyu grass growth model published yet? No, it is not. And you asked me that before, too. Shame on me. <laughs> I think, uh, Carolyn, what you and I need to do and other NRCS folks are to really uh, begin a process of vetting the, 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 the models and the equations that go into these models and, and test this system across uh, the state to see if, if this, um, this holds water. Uh, this is you know, focused on data collected uh, in the Kula Belt of Maui. So the question is, is well, is this gonna work in, uh, on the Big Islands where Kukui grass is also prevalent? How is this going to work with other grass species at different elevations? Guinea grass, for instance, is gonna have a completely different model. So no, I, I, I think it, we really need to spend some time doing this. And so Carolyn, let's reach out and, and touch base and come up with maybe a game plan. I hate to put this on you, but uh, the answer is no, it hasn't. And yes, we do. Okay, we have another question. Um, a couple of informational questions. One was to see slide 30 again, please, about slide the conclusion 30. and findings. Yeah. So, and while you're not, while you're navigating there, um, that question was from Tamara Hind. Um, okay. Andrea Gill asks, please repeat the name of the researcher looking into using native species as competitor, competitors to grass, as Jim oh. mentioned. Yes, yeah, so, um, uh, so this is slide 30, but to answer your uh, question, maybe Creighton Litton's on the line. So this was Creighton's uh, PhD student. I was on her committee. Her name was Lisa Ellsworth. And Melissa, if you or uh, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, I forgot the name of the person who asked the question. But anyways, if you could send me an email, I can find the literature, the published publications 
that she uh, that we have on that subject uh, to help uh, push the, that. But uh, definitely the um, the uh, corresponding author for that would be Dr. Litton in our NREM department. Okay, we have another question. I don't question. know if this is the slide that uh, she was wanting to see possibly, but maybe not, I'm not sure. I, I think so. Well, um, I'll, I might also ask for your PowerPoint so we can share that later. Yeah, definitely. So the audience is still here. I will uh, offer Melissa at PFX the, the PDF version of this for you guys to uh, use at your leisure. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Taylor Marsh. He says, thanks, James. Right. Specifically on Oahu, guinea grass has been the main fire adapted fuel threat species in the wildfire context, despite having our own large fountain grass populations. Is Amazapir our best tool for suppressing guinea grass on Oahu? Yeah, and then this kind of alludes to the previous question. As an unknown, and, and the short answer is we got to find out. Uh, I think so. And, and so Taylor, what, what we can do is maybe we can organize on, um, and maybe with Clay on this, um, figure out uh, uh, experimental designs or demonstrations to look to explore this option. My sense of guinea grass is if we're going to look at uh, mature climax, uh, dried out heavy stands of guinea grass versus young actively growing guinea grass that was mowed a month prior you know, that's going to be your difference i think really controlling the height and the above ground biomass prior to herbicide treatment regardless of the herbicide is really going to pay the dividends i think it's going to require a, you know a, a two-step process but out of those options uh, to me mazapir is going to offer the greater residual and systemic qualities that we're probably looking for. But at the end of the day, Roundup is so cheap these days, you put them in together and uh, that's gonna give you the all, all of the above. Uh, Fusillade is gonna, uh, may or may not be useful in this condition just because of, I mean, I wouldn't even put plants, I, I'm concerned about putting plants in with guinea grass without proper early effective suppression. Okay, um, we have Jenna Master, says, Jenna Master says, thanks, great talk. Um, James Harmon asks, what is known about the native seedling survival under grass being treated with imazapyr? Interesting. Um, so I'm not, the, I'm not the person to test that, but I am familiar with uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Uh, Yelenek. Uh, on the Big Island, she's with USGS, and her team is, is specifically exploring that condition. And I, I'm going to paraphrase and probably get her research wrong, but let me try to answer it the best I understand it is. So what we understand up in Hakalau is they are world famous for their ability to restore koa without plants and seedlings, to where it's very observable and fascinating uh, exploration on Google Earth, for instance. And Koa does really well in that environment. It's its suitable habitat. And they were, it's a one of our best examples of successful restoration in Hawaii. Um, it wasn't intended to be just a Koa forest. It, it really, what it was intended for was to serve as a um, as another variable, a, a climax species or keystone species to a more diverse native uh, in, uh, vegetation community. But what they were finding, what we're finding out is, is 20, 30 years later, we're not seeing a lot of the recruitment we're hoping for with the presence of koa as a dominant canopy species. Um, and it has probably a lot to do with the fact that grass is still a major component of the vegetation and is probably serving as an impediment to natural recruitment. So uh, Dr. Yelenek and others are starting to look at grass suppression techniques under Koa canopy as a, as a way to monitor if that will release uh, presumably existing seed banks of native species yet to be determined. Um, uh, so there, there are people looking at that and I'm grateful they are. 
Okay, we have um, an FYI from Andrea Gill. If you need a place to experiment on guinea grass, please contact me at Gill of the Lands LLC. We got right. acres of this stuff and would be glad to host experiments. So maybe not for you, James, but anyone else on the line who would be interested in running such experiments. Um, sounds Absolutely. like Gill of the Lands is a willing host. Very um, good. That's great. We have a, a comment from Julia Lee. Yeah. Just to share. Glyphosate does seem to show some selective qualities at low dosage, about 0.5 to 1%. This includes guinea grass. We need more qualitative data on this as well. Yes, that, that's an, an interesting find. So half to 1% is, well, 1% is venturing into operational concentrations with glyphosate. I've seen anywhere from one to two. I think 5% is, is on the high end. So it's usually one to 2% is an operational concentration. Um, but again, in Julianosis and several others of you know too, I'm a bit of a weed science knob when it comes to concentration and herbicide use rates. I like to know when we're making a herbicide application, you know, how much active ingredient are we applying to the, uh, to the area as a way to decipher low and high dosage. Um, and so for glyphosate, uh, operational uh, efficacy of sensitive species is typically on the one to two pound active ingredient per acre. Uh, Mazapir, on the other hand, its maximum label rate is one and a half pounds per acre, as mentioned earlier. And I, my recommendations have been anywhere from quarter to a half a pound per acre. But to her uh, her point is they she's showing they're they're seeing uh, selectivity uh, uh, on um, on guinea grass uh, with glyphosate at the half to one percent and that's an interesting phenomenon and I wonder how much seasonality and uh, and environmental conditions may play in that selectivity active you know wet actively growing or is it a cold wet summer uh, winter hot dry summer so there's a lot of factors that could influence that selectivity uh interesting observation um so we've gotten through all the questions that people typed in um are there any other questions or comments folks have please do raise your hand or add a question before we wrap up hand raised oh it, uh sorry i'm not see i'm not uh not operating this very well oh it's okay i think there's a hand raised from james Harmon, but i i believe that was we answered his question oh, about sorry. what is known about native seedling survival i believe that was that. hey james can you hear me this is clay yeah clay i can hear you loud and clear I noticed we have some folks from the Western Pacific, so I don't know that you're that familiar with it, but one of the grass species they have there, which is actually native, is miscanthus, a uh, sword grass. And I just wondered if you've ever worked with it or been approached to or had any any idea no. or familiarity with it. No, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm vaguely familiar with it as a biofuel candidate because it produces high biomass. It's uh, very tall. Uh, kind of looks like napier grass is that correct yeah yeah that sounds yeah. right and i think it's it, it's it's big that it's uh guam's biggest problem is that correct in, in places for sure the south guam it's kind of their big fire issue same like us with guinea grass and these other species there it's it tends to be uh this miscanthus yep yeah and so i don't have any personal experience with working with it um and so gosh so let me hit rinse and repeat you know, I think experimentally how we would approach this is I think there's a lot of value in exploring the combination effects of, of mechanical followed by, by chemical regimens. Uh, my concern with a strict chemical regimen inherently is that if you're treating climax stands of this type of species, 
you're likely exacerbating the fire risk associated with that species by actually desiccating and drying down the standing vegetation. So there's a real value to using mechanical to bring it down, not only to remove some of the risk, but also the response that you would get with the recovery, allowing for a, a greater susceptibility of the herbicide. Um, we have a question from Jenna Masters again. Yes, hi Jenna. Are there, are there any moves being made to increase the amount of species on the fuselage label? Um, so Jenna's question is with regard to the fuselage label. Do I have that up? Let me see if I'm smart enough to. Maybe not. No, so, um, sorry, I don't need to share a screen with that, but, um, so for fuselade, strangely enough, so you know, 10 years ago, fuselade was registered for use in, in forestry and natural areas, grass control. And so we were using what's called a section three registration, which is a federal registration. This is where people start to fall asleep, by the way. Um, and somehow uh, Syngenta, the company that is the registrant of that product, fuselade, which is WASPA, uh, decided to discontinue its forestry natural area use, and uh, which put us in a pickle because I was making recommendations based on an old fusillade label. Um, but anyways, with, uh, with Jane Beachy, Julia Lee, Amanda Hardman, and others, we got together and developed a, um, a package, a, a utility package, for in a petition with Syngenta to submit a special local need to the Hawaii Department of Agriculture for establishing what's called a 24C special local need registration. We have that, but it's limited to the species that we had experimental data on that demonstrated efficacy of fuselade on grass species. And, I, and, and also what was already listed on the section three. So we have guinea grass and we have uh, Kikuyu grass and uh, uh, do we have? I don't think we have fountain grass. Anyways, I don't. I don't have the species list in front of me. But the short answer. I gave you a long answer, Jenna. But here's the short answer: is we need to start conducting experiments that are relate for each individual species, testing fuselade on that species to demonstrate measurable effective suppression of growth of those species to demonstrate a utility and function of that to warrant inclusion of that species on the registration. Um, it sounds daunting, but it's fairly straightforward. Um, and certainly within Oahu Army, you guys have the, the capacity and, and IQ to do that kind of work. Um, uh, but, uh, and it also it stays within Hawaii Department of Agriculture. It doesn't have to be vetted by EPA. So the, uh, DOA makes the determination based on uh, the, the data presented on whether or not they'll include that. Okay, I think we're getting close to wrapping up. We have um, comments of appreciation on the recap and your responses. And one looks like last notes from Guam, um, Christine yeah. Barron um, saying for the miscanthus. Um, we use both chem mechanical and chemical application on Guam um, using uh, glyphosate to control large stands of miscanthus. Um, kind of connected to a question from JB Friday, would a glyphosate and amazapir combination work out there? Yeah. I, also, Christine yeah. requested that you come out to Guam and visit them. You got it. I love it. Very good. I, you're right. And I think the short answer is, is I think for most of our grass control efforts, um, we know a lot, but I'm quite certain that all of our grass management efforts could be improved upon with, um, with the combination of the science and the management and the experience. We have really experienced groups across the Pacific and in Hawaii um, who are very familiar with the species and how our very limited portfolio of herbicides work, but um, we haven't fully explored the conditions as it relates to climatic events uh, and opportunities created by the fire events that are going to occur. Um, and so, but I, I think more specifically for miscanthus, 
if you're all you're using is glyphosate, my sense is is we start blending imazepir in with that mix and we are expecting to see a different result. So we can talk more about that for sure. Maybe JB, we can get in on a three-party conversation in YouTube place, and maybe a four-party conversation talking about these ideas as new experiments. Great. Um, well, we're almost 15 minutes over, and I think we've gotten to everyone's questions and comments. Um, want to express once again our gratitude and appreciation for you, James, and um, sharing your knowledge with us and yeah, taking the time for this webinar. And thanks to all the folks who attended and are listening in and shared your questions and comments. Um, we will be posting a recording of this on the PFX website, along with it sounds like um, a PDF of James slides. So if you wanna refer back or refer any colleagues back to this presentation, you'll be able to do that um, hopefully within a couple of days on the PFX website. That's great. Well, Melissa and Clay, thank you very much for offering this venue. This is really, anyways, I've always been really interested in the work that I've been doing on this. And again, regrettably, some of this is aging. And I hope we can pick this back up and reinvigorate the need for new knowledge. And so, again, I really appreciate the opportunity for sharing uh, my naive approach to grass control. Hopefully someone got something out of it and I really appreciate the audience. All right, with that, let's call it a wrap. Thank you. You got it, thanks everybody. Take care and happy Thanksgiving. Thanks James, bye everybody. <laughs>